Welcome back! We're here now to discuss episode 9, the penultimate episode of season 1 of House of a Dragon. It is titled The Green Council. Uh, the recap is going to be rather long, I think. It's, it's a lot of moving parts in this episode. Indeed, there's quite a lot of things to keep track of and a lot of things happening. But the episode opens with the discovery of Viserys' body and the news then spreads through the castle. Uh, Alicent finds out first, she tells Otto, and her servant Talia secretly informs Missaria, uh, her patron, uh, that she's working for. And then the small council hears of it from Alicent and Otto. Um, only for Alicent... Uh, at this point, to learn that most of them, except for Lord Beesbury, were already plotting to seize the throne for Aegon. Beesbury is then killed by Kristen Cole, and Harold Westerling takes off his white cloak uh, and says that until a king is chosen, he's you know he's not going to he has no place there. He's not going to serve the council. Alicent objects to the idea of killing Rhaenyra, but is paralyzed when asked what they should do instead. Both Alicent and Otto try to find. Aegon, who has snuck out of the Red Keep, and each of them is intent on controlling him and guiding him towards how to deal with Rhaenyra. Alicent dispatches Aemon and Kristen Cole, while Otto sends the twins Sir Auric and Sir Eric Cargill. Princess Rhaenys, meanwhile, wakes to discover her door locked from outside, and she sees from her window many in the Red Keep are being directed into the dungeons. Among them are Talia and lots of the servants, and Laris is there looking at them, so... Uh, now, Prince Aemon and Sir Criston, they first try a brothel with no success, but they learn that Aegon now has less discriminating taste than what the Street of Silk offers. And we then see what that entails when Eric and Auric enter a place where children are forced to fight in pit fights for the amusement of others, and Eric reveals that Aegon enjoys such sport and then directs his brother to a small child in the basement below with silver gold hair. Uh, Eric believes this is one of many bastards of the prince in this place. Uh, he feels that Aegon does not deserve to be king from what he has seen, being his sworn shield, while, while Auric insists that they must do their duty. A young woman approaches them and reveals that her mistress, the White Worm, knows where Aegon is and will tell the Hand directly for a prize. When we see Otto again, he's in the Red Keep and he's asking the lords uh, who are gathered at court to swear a fealty. And there's an unnamed lord, I don't know who it is, uh, I don't think his name is ever given, but then and Lady Fell, of House Fell of the Stormlands, uh, refuse. Lord Caswell hesitates, and he's a fellow we saw in the sixth episode who offered his services to Rhaenyra. But he hesitates, but he ends up bending the knee, only to later try to slip out of the Red Keep. But um, he is uh, seized and arrested by, by Loras, who kind of realized what was going on. And, he was later found hanging inside the Red Keep, a warning to any who would betray Aegon. Alicent goes to Rhaenys and explains that Viserys is dead, and they are holding her because without Malace, there's a chance that Rhaenyra will be feel forced to kind of negotiate. Uh, Alicent believes Rhaenys should have been queen, and that she should guide Cordus away from war by having the Valorian support Aegon, suggesting that their lies with Rhaenyra has only brought House Valorian heartache. Otto and Rosaria then meet in a public place, and Eamon and Kristen just happen to stumble upon the meeting. Oh. <laughs> a bit so-so. Uh, Otto realises that Rosaria is in fact the White Worm who has sold him information in the past, something that he apparently didn't know until now, and Rosaria reveals that Aegon was in Flea Bottom, which she felt was an unsafe place for him, so she decided to tuck him away somewhere safer. Uh, in return for him, she wants gold, which she receives, and she wants an end to the pit fights involving children. Uh, Eric and Auric are dispatched to a sept where Aegon has been stuffed beneath a votive altar. Uh, he wants to run away, he does not want to be king, but the twins uh, take him out of there and only for Kristen and Aemon to come across them. And Auric and Auric fights with Cole and Eric hangs back and decides to abandon both the prince and his brother in the end, whereas Cole disarms Sir Auric and they take Aegon to the Queen. Some kind of fun sequence there for Aemon and Aegon together. Uh, yeah. uh, Alicent tells her father that a, a peace must be made and that Rhaenyra cannot be killed, but Viserys would want mercy for her. She says Chris and Cole will become the new commander, uh, Lord Commander of the King's Guard. And Aegon will be crowned on the morning in the dragon pit with the crown of Aegon the Conqueror. She leaves him and then she meets with Loras, who reveals he has discovered a spy in the Queen's household, Talia, whose mistress is the White Worm. 
Exchange for for misinformation and the promise to do something about this enemy she did not know existed, she indulges, well, his foot fetish. With the clear implication that this has been a very long-running transaction Mm. between the two, uh, so much so that Otto has noticed that he spent many hours with the Queen and... Oh, yeah, so... Rosario's pleasure house is later put to a torch by one of Loris's agents. Princess Rhaenys is freed by Sir Eric, uh, who's definitely decided to break with Prince Aegon, and he tries to get her to the docks, um, even though she wants to go and get her dragon, but he says they know it's impossible. But they are separated by a crowd being ushered into the dragon pit for the crowning. Um, Rhaenys, approaching the dragon pit, realizes where they are going, and uh, she watches the beginnings of the crowning, but then she slips out of the crowd and down into the depths of the dragon pit. Meanwhile, the initially reluctant Aegon, who doubted his father really wanted him to be king, hears the acclamation of the crowd and starts to embrace the idea of being the king. It's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Uh, he raises Blackfire up again and again, and the crowd is cheering. And then there's a rumble, and suddenly the floor of the dragon pit explodes, and out comes Malaise with Rainers on the Red Queen's back. There's going to be a lot of reaction to that one. Yeah. Alison puts herself between Aegon and a dragon as it approaches. Rhaenys kind of stares down at them and Malice roars in her face, a long scream. But then Rhaenys turns a dragon and manages to fly through the remaining space and the doors that were very fun that part because as oft, as the crowd is trying to get out, the people outside are like, shut the door, shut the door, keep the dragon in there. And Otto's like, open the door, open the door, we don't want to be in here with dragon. So he manages to uh, fly out of the sky and escapes into the sky. And that is how that episode ends. It's a very, um, very kind of, you know, cinematic, epic yeah. ending. I, I had some questions about the last scene. Like, where is the button of the dragon that you push to make it just go roar instead of... Roast. Well, we've seen we've seen with Damon at least. I, yeah. I, I think they're getting the idea across that to some degree there's a the, telepathic. Yes, I guess so. But the commands help you form just, the thoughts you know, and could have had a little auto snack at least. It would have been nice if she she'd said something. But I, if she said something to a dragon, would we have heard it over its scream? No, I suppose not. Yeah. And I guess she didn't need to tell them anything after Melis had her little. Yes, uh, I, I just think of uh, Salvador Son's joke about the, the, brown, me the brown the brown pants. pants. I, I I had to give them credit for uh, apparently managing not to, to void their bladders and that well, was well we don't know that it doesn't really I suppose. follow up on I that suppose. we don't see the floor. Uh, next after this, let's discuss uh, changes and choices again. There's a lot of choices in this episode that are mm-hmm. are kind of we're picking things little tweaks here and there and, and some not so little. Now, the titular Green Council, one could say, the specific meeting here that we have after the death of Viserys and when the news are given, there's uh, a lot of little changes just in that scene and in how that shapes up. Uh, Some small and some fairly significant. Um, For example, the uh, surprise that Alicent gets that there's been plotting uh, without her prior to Viserys' death, there's there's no evidence of this in the book. Right. Uh, the source, the main source we have for it is, is Grandmaster Powell. Uh, he was present. He wrote about his role, and we'll discuss more of that uh, a bit later because there's some choices there as well. But he gave the fullest account, um, and there's some questions as to did he say all the things he claims to have said? Um, how much is he tidying up? How much is he tidying up for himself? I mean, uh, just a touch. Uh, we'll touch again on Orwell. Yeah. It, it is it is an interesting piece, but but there is no sign that this was like no one should say. Oh, we were pro- you know they yeah. these were almost the certainly there were plans in in Otto, place of some yeah. kind. I mean, Otto knew that this day was coming. I would at say some the, point. the main thing I would say is is the idea of Alison not knowing is uh, no, it doesn't I, really fit the book at all. Um, no, it doesn't. It's very different thing there going on. A very different relationship with Otto, Otto and, and Alice and, and, I, Rhaenyra, uh, and with Rhaenyra, of course. So, so, so well. I don't think that, no, she, yeah. if there was any plotting, she would have been aware. Uh, the death of Lyman Beesbury. Um, it's a case of manslaughter here, rather than, well, there's different accounts. Uh, or while, who again was there, he said, well, Beesbury was arrested and sent to the black cells, and he was an old man. He had served, as he claimed, you know, all the way from Jaehaerys, yeah. and died of a chill. So that would be manslaughter. 
Yeah. Uh, where so yeah, shoving his head down so forcefully that his head mm -hmm. cracks and he dies is is definitely manslaughter. Now at the same time, again, his account is of as a suspect because of the circumstances under which he wrote them down. Because well, I think we mentioned this before. His account is really interesting because he is writing his account of all these things while he is in a cell, <laughs> um, imprisoned uh, down the road, and is basically trying to um, save his skin. So there's, there's real questions about how honest he is about his role, about what was going on, and so Certainly on. has reasons to polish up some things. Now, but the, this bit, I, I feel like... I mean, because, you know, Septon Eustace, who was not actually present, mm -hmm. says Kristen Cole actually cut his throat. Yeah. So that's murder. And Mushroom, also not present, he's supposed to be on Dragon Soda at the time. He says that Cole threw Beesbury out of window. I think that one could be dismissed because there's a lot of focus here about the secrecy. You see this in this episode where they're gathering every, as many people around and tossing them into cells to yes. keep quiet. Uh, yes, I think if, if Beast Boy had gone flying out through a window, that it would have the word would have spread. very faster. secret. So uh, yeah. Um, now uh, Loris, we've spoken a little bit about the Loris in the recap, and he was actually Master of Whispers at this time in the novel, and he does not quite seem to hold that position in the show. I mean, he's talked about serving Otto as well as Alicent that he can serve both of them basically so he's sort of unofficially that but, but he is not present as he's supposed to be yes and because he actually according to the accounts he suggests a blood oath to bind the council together and that he was the first to to cut his hand here they've kind of made him more secret in a sense that he is uh, He's not an official master of whisperers. Yeah. I mean, he is officially working as with Lord Confessor. Lord Confessor, but not in the master of whisperers role. And, and just to go back to our while here, actually, um, again, in his account, he kind of says at first he spoke all about Rhaenyra and how the king had wanted this and that, and that only, and he made some very eloquent arguments for why she should be queen, mm. and but only when he saw that the rest of the council was going the other way, that he kind of unwillingly, reluctantly go along. Um, here he seems to be entirely on board from the start. He yeah, he talks. seems to have been in on the plotting and yes. it's not a surprise to him. It's not a surprise to him. There is that one bit where he tries to tell Lyman Beesbury to watch his tongue. Like he's trying to like warn him like, hey, this just... Yeah, so he may be on the more like, okay, well, I'm going to go along with this idea, but... But he certainly he doesn't necessarily want any bloodshed or anything, so he's trying to um, perhaps minimize the risk of that. Yeah. Um, and then if we go outside of the council scene, we mentioned Caswell again. Now he is somebody who's been seen twice with the Rhaenyra. Once when he offered her support after the birth, and she said, you know, there may come a day when we, I need your support. And then he was greeted her in episode eight when they arrived. Yes. So he's shown himself as very loyal. Uh, he refuses to forswear his oath to support Rhaenyra, and others who do so are um, executed directly. In, in the books, we know that there are many, and he is one of, of them, who are executed uh, directly. There's Lord Hayford, Lord Merriweather, Lord Hart, Lord Buckler, and Lady Fell are the others that are named. Now they opt to hang him on the show, which yeah. is uh, unusual because this is nobles have the right to be beheaded rather than hanged. I'm surprised by that. They should have. I mean, this is even if he's trying to sneak out, they yeah. he should still have been beheaded. Yes, I mean, this is a, the perfect moment for you know head on spike basically as a warning. I'm surprised yeah. that they were the hanging, but I mm. I don't know why. It actually, be an interesting question to ask sometime. Uh, as in, why hang him rather than have his head bare? Might have been easier, technically speaking, because they have to make a prosthetic head and, and, and the like. I suppose so. Uh... Uh, Alice and Emilio, now this is, this is a big one. Um, placing them as such close friends of a similar age has massively changed Alison's feelings about what's going on. Uh, this is deliberate. I, uh, we were discussing this the other day, and I... To me, I go back to what Ryan said in our interview with him, where he said that he doesn't think about characters being likable or not. He mm -hmm. thinks about whether they're interesting. And I think, in a lot of ways, they think this version of a story is what they feel is the most interesting version of a story that they could tell, the most interesting way to adapt it. So having Alison be kind of reluctant, have being, you know, the human heart and struggle with itself, because the Alison of the book 
is a decade older, is as soon as she has a son, she's like, he's going to be king. He should be king. She's yeah. on board 100% with with the crowning. There's no question. There's no there's no account. There's no hint at any moment at this phase of things that she has any hesitation. Uh, the only thing that comes up, um, and this is accurate, is that while she doesn't propose uh, terms to be offered to Rhaenyra, Reeves or Wilde who offers those uh, suggests that they should offer terms, Alicent and Helena, interestingly enough, who is directly involved uh, mm. to some degree, uh, does say that Chiefing's term should be offered. She agrees with that. So, so that part is that that's still like you know. Well, we'll try to end it, you know, peacefully and so on, and and just have our way. But but this whole oh you know, you but you know like no one thinks actually this is a big change actually. Viserys's wishes are never really questioned. As in, no one says, oh, in his last moments, he said Aegon should be king. No one tries to justify it that way. This is mm. entirely an, an invention of a show. Um, there's no way a while would have left it out, I think. if they, if they yeah. pre- So no one claims this. They just say he was wrong to have Rhaenyra as his heir. All the laws, the, the prior the presidents, presidents yeah, exactly. say that Aegon should be king, and we're rectifying that. No one tries to say, well, it was Viserys' uh, last wishes. So that, that is a big change as well, because... That kind of it, it opens it up for her to have this. Um, oh, maybe he, he did want this, mm. and uh, and have this uncertainty about am I doing my husband's wishes now? And uh, uh, I, I have a lot of feelings about in general. I mean, I have a lot of feelings about the Alison Rain era change in terms of more specifically with Alison, the way we see her interacting with Otto, for example, and also her interactions with, with Rhaenys. Um, basically, I feel like her whole first season kind of sums up the, the patriarchy made me do it. Yeah, I mean, I've seen It, it sort of takes a lot of agency away from her and maybe somehow, well, that's the idea that we're portraying a character who doesn't have a great deal of agency of her own but I, I tend to personally find characters more interesting if they have agency or at the very least think they have agency yeah. and mean, act accordingly there's a scene with, with Rhaenys where doesn't Rhaenys pretty much accuse her of like deliberately constraining herself within rather than trying to well, she's, a line she's, she says that, she's saying that you're not trying to flee your prison you're trying to open a window or, yeah. or something like that I don't quite. F- it just seems like like they're acknowledging that this is a, a that someone like Rainus could read this exactly like that. But she's mm. her agency is compromised. Like she thinks she's in a gilded cage, and her ambition is I'll open the crack a little bit just by having my son on the throne and having some influence. And then she goes, "Oh, haven't you ever?" Well, I mean, certainly that's what she says. That you know, yeah. we can we can guide the men, and and the the whole guiding the men part is the other big yeah. problem that I have with the framing of the first season. I think this may be something that we discuss more in a final video, but I I have a real problem with the portrayal of it's all the men's fault that we go into yeah. war. That you kind of getting the sense yeah. here that women should be there guiding them towards peace. News flash, not all women are peaceful. Yeah, no no, <laughs> I, I think um it's interesting. I, I, I think certainly Alison made a choice. I, I My read, and I, I know the actress Olivia Cook has, has, in her mind, she read it as her character, genuinely believes it's her duty to fulfill his last wish. She genuinely believes he said, oh, I, Aegon should be the heir. But she said, was that wishful thinking on her part? I don't know. So she's leaving it open, but mm. in the back of her head. And to me, that reads much better that she wants to hear this because it justifies everything she's gone, gone through. Mm. It justifies the fact, you know, what is this you shall call that honor and decency will win out in the end. Which is, of course, yes. the, the hypocrisy of it when her son Aegon is a rapist and a drunkard and a, a fool. And oh, she's, but she still loves him. But she still loves him. Even the, if he's no son of hers. Yeah, the, the imbecile. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, speaking of Aegon. Speaking of Aegon, indeed. Um, he was uh, not in the Red Keep at the time, so this is correct. Uh, I can't say that he was either with a well-born merchant's daughter, who was his mistress, that is Septon Eustace, 
or that he was uh, down in the fle uh, flesh dens of Flea Bottom watching children fight and being pleasured by a young girl. This according to Mushroom, of course. So, uh, there's no I, hint that he was sought out by two different groups going after yeah. him and this yeah. sort of tension or that the White Worm had any involvement with it. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's some fun scenes in that yeah. whole, but I also thought maybe a little overdoing it, the whole, you know, the future of the realm depends on who, who finds him. And it seems very a very odd thing, like... And that chance meeting there. Yes, that that was that was a little bit of lazy writing. I it was the oh we just we were giving up and oh we just happened to meet them. Like, why are we even meeting in open? Why aren't they meeting in some little warehouse or some building somewhere? Is it it yeah. it is a little bit of a, again it's it's a bit of a shortcut to get what they want, but it's like. Uh, well, certainly the scene with Damon and, and Aegon is, you know, I don't want to be king, I, you know, I have no sense of duty, and... Uh, they have uh, no argument for no me. No argument yeah. for me, basically. Uh, and now speaking of Aemon, um he describes himself as a reader of philosophy and history. He's quite cold-blooded, I think, rather than hot-blooded. Yeah. Which is... Uh, Aemon is described in the book as he's a wild and hot-blooded, mm. or quite a temper. Never forgetting a slight. Never forgetting a slight. And that, that, that part seems to be yeah. true. But, um, and... His his thing about you know when they if they come looking for me I don't I intend, intend to be found I intend to be found he yeah. he wants to be king uh, he never expressly explicitly says he wants to be king in the book uh, there is an occasion later where he gets to try a crown on let's say and he kind of quips that it suits him better than his brother it looks better on him but uh, while he could have called himself king technically I I I feel like this might be a little spoilery but. He he doesn't. He actually does not do so during this time frame. So yeah, I'm sure he thought he would have been a good king compared to his brother, but uh, he didn't seem to have that ambition to try and and uh, you know hope that the worst happens to his brother so he can get it. No, I I think perhaps that they are a they're playing up um, a similar scenario that they had with Viserys and and Damon yes. in the. Uh, the ambitious younger brother, but how far will he go, basically? And it also feels like they are leaving the possibility of making him a bit more of a combination of Aemon and Daeron. I mean, I know George said that, you know, yes, Daeron was not in the season, but, you know... The implied that he'll be in yeah. the next, but... I... I I assume, uh, like, they've been yeah. breaking down the season, so yeah. I guess he knows it, that they have decided. But at this stage where they're filming this season, I think it's very clear, but they're, they're like, they're not... Because they haven't sense. added him clearly into the family tree thing yet. They, there is some little um, blood trail. There's a blood board. trail, but it looks like it kind of doesn't run all the way. Yeah. Like, and so they've definitely part. kept it sort of, we're not saying yes or no for this season. Yeah. And, and so then, giving, giving him, because uh, David is supposed to be kind of very intelligent and also... Very courteous, courteous and... chivalrous. I don't want to say Eamon is that, but the intelligence of reading philosophy and history. Yes. Eamon is is a warrior through and through. He's not a, a scholar really yeah. in the books. No, um, he just studies the blade. <laughs> he studies the blade. I've seen a lot of jokes about this, and I I, I was a little confused, but I've heard the meme. Uh, obviously, I guess it was a the one eyed, pale haired <laughs> fellow who has devoted his life to studying the blade. But, uh, he he's a good warrior. Uh, he's not he's not some. Um, Super swordsman, I guess I should say. At least, I don't know. I, basically, I, my idea is this over the top anime, um, you know, katana, samurai master. That, that's not quite him. But anyways. Well, they seem to be making that in the show that he's supposed to be pretty. Well, I mean, he is good. He is good. Is, is, is it sort of like the, you know, one of the great warriors of the realm? I, he, he's never explicitly called like that. True. He is not Arthur Dane. No. <laughs> No, who is? Who is? <laughs> who is? Or, or aim on the Dragon Knight, or... Uh, what else we got here? Um, yeah. Um, Rhaenys, um, she's not captured in the book because she's not even present. So uh, there's no scene with Malise in the Dragon Pit staring down Alicent and, and, and Aegon. Yeah, she should be on um, Dragonstone. They, they're on Dragonstone already. Or well. Driftmark, Dragonstone, what have you. Uh, obviously, they wanted to directly involve her here and yeah. have her make a decision about which way she was going. Uh, Loras and Alison, this whole thing is not at all from the text. <laughs> this, I mean, Mushroom would have mentioned it. If, Mushroom probably would have mentioned it. Like, if there was any hint of it, Mushroom would have mentioned it. That's true. So I, I think you can see if you say this is an invention. I, I can't say 100%, 100, 100%, but 
it couldn't have happened, this sort of thing. But, but I, there is no hint in the text, and I mean, given that Mushroom mentions every salacious thing that is possible or impossible, and yeah. given that he was under everybody's beds... Yeah, and no, it seems very unlikely. Yeah. It seems very unlikely. Uh, to me, I, I I, admit this one is like, uh, I'm a little, like, to me, it's like, is this a little, it's a little too much. I don't quite understand yeah, why they feel we no, need to I'm do it. No, I'm not quite sure about that. I, I, you know, I, I think Loris is pretty creepy as he is. Yeah, and I don't have a problem with kinks and, and so on. No, it's just, it's just, I don't see why they're adding that to, I mean, we've already seen that he has a hold on her by having murdered people in her name and made her extremely uncomfortable uh, and now basically she's afraid that if she coughs the wrong way he will go out and murder somebody pretty yeah. much so I think they could have left it at that that was that was a good setup that way um, Otto calls Viserys Viserys the Peaceful um, this is actually not uh, an epitaph that he has uh, he doesn't really have and a proper epithet. In Early in his reign, he was known as the Young King, in contrast to his grandfather, the Old King. That's so, uh, then they abandoned that when he got older. Yeah. So, so it's fine. It's, it's interesting when he's threw in that little thing. Yeah. Uh, Christian Cole. Now, Cole is remembered in history in the books as the Kingmaker. And yes, he's given the crowning. He does, uh, both in the book and on the show, he is the one who actually puts the crown on Aegon's head. But it feels like his role in pushing for Aegis' association is kind of uh, a bit reduced compared to the book. He's kind of a bystander. I guess he was on board with the plotting. It's not clear, though, actually, but he was even aware that Otto was planning this. Given how close he is to Alicent. Yeah. I think they kind like of left him out. They probably left but him out. But he's fine with it, of, of course. Yes. Uh, in particular, um, Septic News is a character... Uh, in his account, he says Aegon was in fact reluctant to become king, but but Cole was instrumental in convincing him that Rhaenyra would kill him and his siblings. And that was the only thing that convinced Aegon. If it hadn't been for that, Aegon wouldn't have uh, accepted being crowned. So so you can see that Kingmaker Sombra kept coming out of that idea, yeah. but he crowned him, but he was instrumental in pushing him towards it. Here, not so much. No. Um, and I mean, to some extent, it feels like it all ended up soft in the book than perhaps George had intended it from the start. Sure. I, I think he wanted him to have much more of an active role as being sort of, well, because of his anti rhaenyra feelings, basically that ended up with him pushing for Aegon. Um, and of course, he does that by saying that Rhaenyra would kill him, him and his siblings, which is interesting that Aegon needed that push um, and that he needed that push from Cole in particular rather than you know Otto or Alicent who have been the ones to voice such concerns on the yeah. show um, so yes it doesn't he doesn't quite make as much sense as the kingmaker um. yeah. okay let's move on to uh, some background yes now, in this episode, we get to see uh, Aegon the Conqueror's crown. And uh, there's actually a little bit of a change there as well, because Aegon's crown in the book has uh, multiple rubies spaced out in a band of iron or valerian steel. Uh, George has... Weaver back and forth. back and forth. Valerian uh, steel would be very much more cool. Uh, so here it is just the one ruby. Um, Jahiris' crown is... Also different from the book, which we've mentioned before, it's supposed to be a circlet with seven different sem uh, precious stones. Um, and another crown that uh, hasn't featured on, on the show, but was part of the many Targaryen crowns that ended up being created by various kings, was Aenys's crown, which was a uh, yellow gold, quite ornate, inlaid with the jade and pearl with the faces of the seven shown on it. So. That was when he was trying to show himself as very pious, in contrast to, to Maegor, I suppose, and courting the faith in that sense. Um, yes, yes so in the future there'll be other kings, and uh, there'll be a habit of the, the kings to come changing the crown on occasion. Mm -hmm. uh, someone will have a, just a very plain, simple gold circlet. Someone else will have a crown woven of flowers and vines. <laughs> Guess who? <laughs> uh, then there's a huge and gaudy kind of grotesque red gold crown. You can guess maybe who that might be. A very warlike crown. 
uh, with sharp black iron points on a, on a red gold circlet, which was the last crown worn by Aerys II, the Mad King. It was not, but he was not the originator of that crown. Uh, and an interesting thing um, about that is the fact that that warlike crown was obviously a choice after Aegon's, the Conqueror's crown, apparently disappeared. Uh, yes, so uh, that, because there is a future king who will decide to also wear Aegon's crown. It, I mean, the kings basically tended to pick the crown. If they didn't make a new crown, they picked the crown that they associated most with themselves. Yeah. And in this case, it uh, didn't make it back home again. Yeah. Uh, child pit fighters. Now, that, that is mm -hmm. actually a thing that is, in fact, uh, if you've read The Sunways and Fire, you have met one of these characters already. Biter from Rorge and Biter. With a file uh, teeth and everything. With a file teeth and everything. Now, uh, George ex decided to give people the whole background between Biter and Rorge in a CBC radio event in 2006, uh, where he revealed that Rorge owned a, a pot shop, basically like a low rent bar in Flea Bottom, the really part, bad part of King's Landing, and Rorge would stage rat fights and dog fights, bear cub fights make money. At some point he found young Biter, a big ugly kid with no parents or something like that, and took him in. Started putting Biter into the fights, fighting Mastiffs and Bear Cubs, etc. Uh, and then George apparently said something along the line, and this all led to Biter's winning personality. So there you go, that's the backstory for Biter if I have written yet, but I might. So that is a story. I, I mean, obviously we have it mentioned that, that Egan was one of the accounts was that he was indeed off watching yes, these fights. Absolutely. So it is a thing that they, they do in uh, in Flea Bottom and apparently given uh, Biter's uh, backstory, Masaria does not su succeed in stamping that out. Yeah. And I we didn't touch we on didn't that. We did touch on this one, yes. No, I but I'm surprised, yes. Why are we making Masaria into uh, Varys 2.0? Yeah, it's Thinking a very strange children. choice. It's a very, it feels... Or is she, she's like Varys and, I don't know, Littlefinger had a love child. Or it something. feels repetitive. It feels odd. It feels, it doesn't feel right to me. It's nice, I guess, as she's got an, an, a noble, somewhat noble desire. But uh, it feels, it feels very at odds with the character as described. It feels very at odds with with the whole story that someone would do this. I, I don't know, I, I felt, that one felt, you know, I was distracted by the whole like, oh, and here we just happened to stumble across this meeting. Yes. It was very, I understand, they had to try to do a lot in this episode and they had to, but it, it's not, it was not, this is not the best writing they've done, that particular section. No. It, it did take down, that, that, those two bits kind of took the episode down and like, the foot fetish. And half a knot, and the foot fetish, like uh, half a point, Maybe a point down from what I would otherwise rate it. Still a very good episode. It's just there there are some creaky creaky parts to this one, more yeah. so especially more so than compared to the previous episode. Right. Um more background stuff that we would want yes. to talk about. This is kinda cool, yeah. And uh, the cataclysm of the Sept of uh, Remembrance, which there's this scroll that we we see glimpse that it has been written for the High Septon yeah. to uh, proclaim or uh, part of his proclamation for for Aegon at the Dragon Pit, and it mentions the cataclysm of the Sept of Remembrance. This refers to an event during the bloody reign of Mago the Cruel. Um, Mager and the Faith did not get off to a good start, or end for that matter. The Sept of Remembrance was the third sept built in King's Landing. It was raised sometime after 10 AC in honour of Queen Rhaenys, who had died in Dorne. Uh, and it served at the headquarter of the Warrior Sun, the most illustrious arm of the Faith militant. Uh, and when uh, the Faith rose up in rebelling against the Targaryens because of their incestuous practices, uh, Mager fought a trial of seven, seven against seven, uh, and was nearly killed. But after a long period in a coma, he woke up. Uh, exactly how that happened and what his mother had to do with that. Yes. And he went Tiana of the Tower as well. Yes, yeah, so he got up on Valyrian and then he flew over to the Sept of Remembrance and burned it down, um, killing hundreds of the warrior sons. Yeah, that was a really fascinating thing. Passage. I think we have a nice in the Warriors of Fire. We have a depiction of the Sept of Remembrance being burned. I believe, uh, yeah. That that and it wasn't just it was just the burning. Actually, as I recall now, uh, he actually had 
ordered men, guards and so on to ring around it. And they shot anyone who fled yes. would be shot down or cut down. Um, so yeah, the, the, the trial of seven, I mean, was led by the, the grand captain of the, the warrior sons kind of representing the faith against mm. his claim to be king and, and so on. And so it was a bunch of warrior sons versus seven men, including Magor. Um, this is very interesting that they kind of threw in this the separate rumors. Like, I, 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 we don't see the full scroll. And yes, we, we paused. We tried to read it <laughs> as it could. Um, we don't see the full scroll, so we don't quite... But it seems to be a little bit uh, of the, the High Septum, basically. Well, you know, we've had the bad things in the past, like the Faith and the Targaryens, but uh, uh, we're going to be buddies now, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, interestingly, we, uh, after it was burned down, everyone killed... Magor ordered, ordered the ruins to be raised, and uh, it was on the hill of Rhaenys, and that is where the future dragon pit would be built. So we are on the spot, which is probably why he mentions it as well, of uh, course, yeah, this in is the scroll, little... but this is on the location where uh, a bunch of uh, the fake militant died. And since we're talking about the dragon pit, and uh, we're in the section about dragons, let's talk about a bit about the dragon pit. Um, well, the Dragon Pit was built by Magor, as I said, uh, in its place, starting in 45 AC. But it wasn't concluded until 55 AC during the reign of Jaehaerys I. Um, as it was being built, I mean, it, it really does have, like, room for people. Like, it is this huge arena for some... It's not really explained why Magor wanted that. But I think it's supposed to have seating for 80,000 people. Which is, uh, I don't know what the Colosseum in, in Rome. Maybe he was planning to have dragon fights. Or like. Executions, executions maybe, and yeah. wanted to make sure if the people of King's Landing could be herded Exe in to watch. E executions and... by dragon? Yeah, probably. Um, yeah, it was made of the crew. <laughs> I believe the first major event, actually, it was even before it was completed, was the Golden Wedding, where um, Alyssa Valorian, the, the mother of Jaehaerys, married Lord Rugor Baratheon. Um, through her comes. Uh, uh, Rhaenys, her daughter Jocelyn Baratheon ends up marrying um, uh, Aegon, or a Aemon uh, Targaryen, mm -hmm. the eldest son of Jaehaerys, and has Rhaenys. Um, but uh, in any case, so it's completed with the five. And one of the things we get in the books is, uh, it's Barristan Selmy who talks about the idea that the Mace, some Maesters have it. Dragons never grew to the same size as Beleriand or Volgar. And some speculate it was the dragon pit that is to blame mm -hmm. somehow. But um, the dragons are meant to be under the sky. They're not to, meant to be in buildings. Uh, but one of the details is, is actually about the layers that the dragons had dug deep inside the hill are actually said to be like five times larger than the caverns on Dragonstone. So to me, what's probably more likely is, is A, we're told that after the doom, magic, the, the strength of magic seemed to wean across the world, became less powerful. I think dragons being creatures of magic, that may have had an effect. And we even hear this about the idea that the giants are dying out, um, the, the the dire wolves are dying out. All I mean, in, in literally in the dance of dragons, we're told by the children of the forest that magic is, is falling away, um, that all these creatures of magic are dying away because the magic itself is, is weakening. Uh, and then we're told, uh, in A Clash of Kings, I believe, uh, by Quaithia of Ashai, that, you know, people who could do magic, who did little tricks and so on, can now do real magic again. And she thinks it's because the dragons being mm. born has somehow... Whether the dragons are able to be born because magic is coming back, or whether the dragons being born makes magic come back. So kind of a, a, a dragon or the egg kind of situation. It's a dragon or the egg situation, yes. Uh, very much so. And I think probably the heat, I mean, you know, we... George has talked so much now about fire magic and blood magic and all these connections. So, yes, the dragons are very much interwoven with fire magic, all these things. And uh, but which one? Yeah, which one is the dragon or the egg? Eh? And so, uh, speaking of heat, I mean, there's another theory. But what could have is that it's, it's it's not the 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 place being too small or too built, but that it wasn't hot enough. Because yeah. they their caverns would have been quite warm. I mean, Dragonstone yeah. is a volcanic island. It's smoky. The mountain, you know, it still mm. smokes. We haven't heard of an eruption in ages, but it still mm. smokes and so on. And uh, even on the show, they've been making a big point. They've invented this whole thing of these mobile 
braziers or you kind incubators. of incubators, incubators, right? Yes. That but that keep the eggs yeah. warm, which are like actually like in coals. So mm. that that's kind of interesting. I, that may be a factor. I mean, I like the way they did it when a uh, demon was digging out the egg in the sense that it's very much like you know a reptile would lay eggs and they, they would dig it down in some hot materials you can see that so whatever he's digging yeah. it is basically hot i assumed it was dragon feces I, kind of a what it could have been called manure actually in, in <laughs> by george in, in uh fire and blood there's a pile of dragon manure which is what uh little joffrey is pushing to oh, buy yeah. payment, so. it's probably an accurate given that no, they're not manure, no no manure is not what that would be Cat, I suppose. Uh, yes, we probably shouldn't pirate. get into that. However, it can't smell that bad, I just realised. Why not? Well, we have the mention in the first episode where Emma complains about uh, the, the Rhaenyra. The Ceres right. as well. Yes. As well. But, now that we talked about the dragon pit, they had a wedding in there. If it was meant to have events... Oh, it wasn't was these... really being used, though. It wasn't done yet. No, but if, if Mago intended to use it after, do you really think... For maybe? executions, though. Mm -hmm. and that, uh, weddings, I think, was a usual choice. You, but you don't think any of the dragons had moved in yet? I mean, they, if they did the caverns first, even if they hadn't finished everything on top, I don't the dragons recall, could have moved in. I don't recall when we were told the first dragon is actually in there. I thought they waited until it was done, but I, you're, you're right. Nick. If, I mean, they just need the caverns. They don't yeah, need yeah. the seating. Um, <laughs> now, finally, the, notably the dragon Vermifor, who's still around at this point, uh, and is the largest dragon after uh, Vagar uh, in this period. He is a dragon of um, Jaehaerys, uh, the old king. Was born somewhere in the 30s, 30 AC, so it would be about 100 years old at this point, and, and likely spent plenty of time in Dragon Pit, and it's quite large. It's not, it's not like it's some... Huge difference between Vagar and and Vermifor, as I recall. It's 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 like Vermifor. It's his age. Vagar is older, but if you know Vermifor had lived to be that long, Vermifor might well have been as, as big. Hmm. No, it's it, it's hard to say whether whether the decline in size maybe also just related to decline in magic. Yeah. Um, Later on, certainly. I mean, they will. You know, they they will be getting smaller. There will be problems. Um. I don't know if they mentioned it. I mean, I think they kind of skipped it because Reina, the daughter of Damon and, and Lena Valorian, uh, her first egg hatched, but it was this weak, pitiful little thing that died within hours. Mm. And then she got a second egg and she was like keeping it close all the time, and, you know, worrying over trying to get it. I don't, I don't think they mentioned that first egg, so we, we just have the impression that she's had the one, but maybe yeah. they just it's a background detail that they didn't bother getting into. That's true, but yes, there's... I think that's the first example we have of explicitly a malformed sort of that doesn't yes, survive. But yeah, uh, must happen. But uh, um, there was something else that popped into my head about dragons and eggs. There, as obviously we don't want to go into too many spoilers here. But uh, obviously, at some point, it seems that there definitely should be eggs left that just stop hatching. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we have attempts later on to to hatch eggs. Oh yeah. Because Baylor was a over them. Um, even if a lot of dragons um, meet untimely demises um, in the f coming years here, there were definitely plenty of eggs left. Yeah. So that's it for the Green Council. So, uh, the next episode is called The Black Queen. Uh, this will be interesting in a different episode. Linda will be doing it solo because I will be. I'm getting abandoned. Being abandoned, uh, HBO is not sending out a screener, and I will be in Spain in Caceres, which is where a lot of the King's Landing stuff was filmed. Uh, the town is kind of promoting tourism and has invited a lot of uh, bloggers and podcasters to Caceres to kind of uh, ha have a symposium, have a, a panel or two, talk about these things. They've um, invited uh, Javi Marcos from Los Siete Reinos. Um, Maglor, uh, another Spanish YouTuber, lots of lots of people. I think there's even someone from Mexico, all the way from Mexico, come over to talk about it. So I will be there over the weekend. I'm going to be on the way back on the on Monday. I won't go, don't arrive until the evening. So Linda will be filming on her own and getting it edited and putting it out. And hopefully it will be out sometime Monday. I don't know. I if you I don't think you can manage Monday morning, but <laughs> and now that will probably be very interesting to see. But uh, maybe maybe time it maybe maybe it'll be time with the British. I don't know what what. Yeah, what? I will be here uh, watching our own little dragons. Yes, and hopefully they will not make it impossible for me to film. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, and uh, what we did discuss is, while I'm not taking part in this, we'll probably do a sort of season one overview mm-hmm. discussion where we will kind of share some more opinions about things they did that we liked and things that we didn't mm-hmm. quite like. But but so far, I think we've, uh, we can say safely, like, we, we like the season. We have Absolutely. problems here and there. There are yeah. things like we would have done differently mm-hmm. if we were running it. But on the other hand, they may have thought of doing it that way and they have practical reasons why they didn't do it that way. So it'll be interesting yeah. to see and also to see, I think... Like the inside the episodes and all these things, mm-hmm. what they're saying afterwards, interviews, no doubt there's going to be interviews in like all the magazines, discussing the finale, discussing the season, discussing where it's going. It'll be interesting yeah. to see what they I say. I mean, I kind of like to do sort of a looking at it in an overarching way, various, you know, story arcs from characters, how did it, you know, work out with the change from the young characters the, the to the old characters. Yes, I, I think we did anyway. I think we did a few, mm-hmm. like, season, like, a, yes. looking back at, at While the we were still there. enjoying it. Yeah. Um, um, or mostly anyway. But yes, I definitely am looking forward to um, the last episode. Yeah, so that, that would probably be, I mean, that would probably be like a week or two I don't know when exactly. We'll, we'll definitely do it, but it'll be like a week or two after the final episode. Um, to digest everything. Yeah. Digest everything mm. and consider it. So uh, until until Monday for Linda, until whatever that episode out is for me, uh, enjoy and uh, we'll see you when we see you. Bye.